This is America on the Road, named best radio show by the International Automotive Media Conference, and now in its 28th year on the air. Thanks for being with us as we bring you the latest automotive information from around the world. A prominent safety organization has some startling things to say about electric vehicles. We'll have the details and our thoughts on this issue coming up. Uh, this kind of came out of the blue to me. Uh, Looking forward to your comments on this, Chris. America on the Road is brought to you by Mercury Insurance and DrivingToday.com. If you're looking to save some money, you should switch to Mercury for your auto and home insurance. Californians save an average of $670 with Mercury. So imagine how much you could save. Get a quote today at DrivingToday.com slash auto insurance. That's DrivingToday.com slash auto hyphen insurance. Also in the news this week, Porsche says criticism of its e-fuel initiative is emotional. That's in quotes. And it is serious about proceeding with its plan. Do e-fuels represent a logical alternative to battery electric vehicles? We'll have more on that coming up in a minute or two. And General Motors says it is considering installing chat GPT in all of its vehicles in the future. We'll have more details on the implications of that and our comments on that as well. I'm Jack Nierad. With me is co-host Chris Teague. Chris lives at one end of the country. I live at, at the other. Each week we get together to talk about cars, the car industry, and how you can get the most for your automotive dollars. Chris, I guess you had uh, your children with you over the weekend as your wife was away. How did that go? I was actually very quiet. You know, my kids are uh, <laughs> easily uh, subdued with snacks and, and treats, but uh, I wish I hadn't tempted the weather gods. The last couple of weeks, I've been complaining about the weather here. Uh, and then, you know, we got snow last week and we got a foot of snow. We're going to get another foot of snow tomorrow night. Uh, so it looks like winter is not ready to uh, to give up here, even though we just flipped the clocks back. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. But uh those, uh, you know, late winter storms, early spring storms, they can give you a lot of snow, can't they? They do, yeah. Well, what vehicle will you be telling us about? What were you driving around with your kids this week? I had the perfect car for it. I had the uh, 2023 Kia uh, Telluride. I can't wait to tell you all about it, not to make a pun about that, but it's a fantastic vehicle for the week. Yeah, good size SUV for... Yeah, kind of a game changer for Kia, so we'll talk about that. I will be road testing the 2023 Honda Accord Sport Hybrid. Uh, the Accord is all new for this year and uh, pretty cool. Hybrid is now the top powertrain, too, which is also interesting. I had a chance to thoroughly test it here in Southern California for a week, and I'll tell you what I discovered later in the show. We have a terrific guest for you as well. Scott Tallon is director of product at Jeep. He and I got together at the recent 2023 Jeep Compass Drive in Malibu. I sat down with him for a detailed interview, so stay with us for that later in the show. I think you'll enjoy what Scott has to say. But before we do anything else, let's bring you some of the most important auto-related news from around the world. And let's dive into this, what I consider to be a, a very interesting, funny, <laughs> all kinds of things, uh, you know, uh, shocking story. Uh, and again, without any kind of attempt at a uh, pun there. The Insurance Institute for Highway Safety, which is funded by the Insurance Institute, um, has said through its vice president, Raul Arbelez, I'm probably butchering his name, but something like that. Um, he says that the hefty weight of an EV poses an increased safety risk for road users and proposes the pr a potential solution, um, lower speed limits. Goodness. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, kind of the last thing we want in a bunch of different ways, I think. I mean, uh, give me your immediate reaction to that. Yeah, you know, uh, I've never, it's hard to advocate for lower speed limits, even if they do technically. I think the data shows that they do save lives. Uh, but, you know, look for the IHS. This is a whole new world. They have already had to upgrade their equipment to handle the heavier vehicles. They said they had to put in a new, I don't know what they call it, to, to push the vehicles down the the testing line there. So, I mean, from a lot of perspectives, uh, I could see their point. I just think, you know, maybe lower speed limits is not going to be the best way to get there. I don't know. <laughs> well, when you look at lower speed limits, you, you do look at, you know, potentially fewer traffic deaths, but then you also have to weigh in the amount of time wasted by people, you know, sitting in traffic or going slower uh, and, you know, kind of figure that out. I mean, I don't know that you balance a life against, you know, hours saved. But, you know, I in the overall scheme of things, I guess if you're looking at the um, metrics on that, uh, maybe you would. But uh, as you say, uh, giant um, 
problem here with with weight. We've talked about weight here on the show as it concerns electric vehicles, but I didn't think it got to this point uh, to where they think this is more of a problem with electric vehicles than fires, which fires from electric vehicles are something that they've been talking about for quite some time. But uh, I guess they're really wondering, you know, what to do about this. I, you know, I hate to think we're going to see lower speed limits because, uh, well, I have to, I kind of push the limit of the speed limit anyway. Uh, but yeah, but think go. about it like this, though. I mean, you have the GMC Hummer EV that's uh, sub three second or three seconds, zero to 60 time. The Ford F-150 Lightning does zero to 60 in three seconds. These are vehicles, supercar speeds from just a year or two ago. And they're in the hands of everyday commuters that don't expect these things, at least, you know, in an everyday situation. So Maybe uh, some education. I don't know. Making everybody take drivers out over again. Who knows? Yeah, I mean, and uh, and that's beyond weight, really. I mean, weight is a, is a problem for handling, and then you have this performance potential that is beyond what most people are used to dealing with. I mean, I I had a situation where I, you know, hit the accelerator pr pretty hard in in a Ford Lightning, and it was a, a bit startled by uh, the amount of acceleration I got just to change lanes on a freeway. Um, it's an issue. I think there's several issues uh, involving EVs because, as you and I know, having driven a lot of them now, it's not just like driving a, a conventional gasoline-powered car. No, there's a lot more under your foot when you step down, uh, at least right off the right off the line. So that that's kind of shocking for some people if you don't drive them every day. And even for us, like you said, like I get in sometimes swapping between a gas car and a an electric vehicle and not not used to that but you know they did some things similar here in maine they raised the speed limit on a certain chunk of highway for uh it was like 15 miles by five miles an hour and then a couple of years later they revisited it and found that there are more people crashing but they also found that those people were distracted while driving so speed played a small role in that but you know so they lower the speed limit back down and of course there's everybody back uh everybody's upset again and the crashes haven't necessarily gone down with commensurate with the the speed limit decrease. So I think that there are other factors there too. You know, distracted driving is a big problem. I'm not going to harp on that, but uh, there are other things that can be done. I think I'm just going to stop harp, like, stop talking about not lowering the speed limit. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I think Porsche, our next story, uh, probably an advocate for keeping speed limits where they are too. I mean, there's a controversy going on in Europe about uh, so-called e-fuels and it really hasn't reached America to any great extent, or certainly to the extent that it, it has uh, become a subject of conversation and maybe great uh, controversy. Um, in Western Europe, uh, Porsche is probably the, the most uh, forward thinking on this issue or, or wants to uh, promote this issue. It's CEO, uh, it's CEO. <laughs> his name is Oliver Bloom. Um, talks about the debate as being emotional. Uh, I want to do air quotes, but I won't uh, <laughs> for that. Um, and he says there's no conflict between electrification and e-fuel e production. But um, what do you think about this? I mean, is a carbon-free fuel, it strikes me, it could be a, a, a boon. Uh, is that an alternative to battery electric vehicles and, and some of the issues we just talked about? Sure, I think so. And Porsche's position is backed up by uh, the pinnacle of motorsport, right? Formula One CEO stepped out a few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, and said, we're never going to have an EV on the grid. We're going to go to uh, fuels. They're developing fuels with the Saudi Arabians, which uh, probably has its own set of challenges. But, you know, look, these cars, they're saying they don't require any modification to run on these fuels. There's zero emissions that come from these fuels. Europe and a lot of European automakers are, you know, into electrification with two feet. So I can understand why he might feel like the response is a little emotional. But I think they need to take as a varied approach as possible to these things, right? I mean, uh, keeping every door open until we know which one is the right one is probably the best way to go. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And uh, the backstory is a little interesting, too, because, of course, Porsche is owned by uh, Volkswagen. Volkswagen is a major advocate and has jumped in with uh, both feet, maybe all three feet, depending on how you look at it, uh, to uh, electric vehicles. So uh, interesting that he's deviating from that norm within the, the company itself. 
Well, and Porsche at the same time has an EV roadmap, right? Today they just came out and announced uh, that they're releasing a flagship EV that will sit above the Cayenne, uh, an electric Macan, electric 718 Boxster and Cayman. So they're headed that direction too, regardless, uh, but they already have a fuel production facility. So it looks like they're produ- they're taking the Toyota approach, right? They're, they're following a few different paths at once. So Yeah, all of the above is uh, kind of where I stand on that stuff. And I think maybe you do too. I think you've mentioned that in previous shows. Yep. Well, General Motors is looking at Chat, chat GPT for its vehicles. It's, it works closely with Microsoft, and I'm I'm wondering about about. I mean, there's a lot of implications to that. Uh, there's a lot of implications to um, AI th- throughout our lives uh, going forward. And uh, uh, I, uh, what's your take on just the initial take on this? <laughs> Well, I have mixed emotions about AI because of, you know, I'm a writer and I think that's one of the things that we're going to have to look at in the next few years as, as kind of taking jobs, so to speak. But, uh, you know, if you're in the cabin and you have uh, Bing powered by chat GPT in your dash, I think there are a lot of things you could do more intelligently interact with the car with your voice is probably the the most the biggest benefit from those things, uh, you know. I, it's hard for me to say. I love technology, but some of these things go a little too far. We talked about shopping and playing games in your car a few few months ago on the show, but I think there there is there are specific use cases where this could be very uh, positive thing for drivers. Yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, I'm also a little concerned about it eavesdropping on me when <laughs> I don't necessarily want to be listened to. I mean, occasionally my um, my iPhone will just start talking. Did you want to learn about this and uh, <laughs> Based on a conversation I'm having with somebody, I don't know that I want to share that with a technology, a multinational technology company. Uh, So I guess I'm a little concerned about that. Yeah, you know, our our Amazon Alexa in the kitchen randomly responds to things that we never even knew that we were saying to it. But, uh, you know, that was one of the big concerns that Toyota expressed when they before they put an Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. That was one of the reasons why they were so slow to put these in is because they didn't want to sacrifice or compromise owner's privacy in any way. Uh, so, I mean, there are real concerns there because it has to be listening to you to be able to respond. Uh, so you have to see how they mitigate that. Right. Well, when we come back, we will be road testing some vehicles and pretty cool vehicles too. The 2023 Kia Telluride and the all new 2023 Honda Accord Sport Hybrid. So stay with us for that with Chris Teague. This is Jack Nierad with you. And stay with us for Road Test. We'll be right back right after the break. Welcome back to America on the Road with Chris Teague. Jack Nierad back with you for Road Test time. And we have some nifty, I'd say very nifty vehicles to talk about this week. The Kia Telluride, uh, a game changer for Kia and an all new Honda Accord. You don't see that every day. So we will be talking about both. And geez, I was so excited. I almost swallowed my dentures there. Um, Tell us about the Kia Telluride. Yeah, Jack, we've talked about the Telluride before, and the last one I tested, it was actually a really interesting weekend, which I'll get to in just a minute. But the thing that we said then is still true today. This is one value-packed SUV. And so it starts out at around $38,000. You get a ton of stuff with that. You get three rows of seating, and you get a standard uh, V6 powertrain. It climbs all the way up to the model that I tested, which is around $55,000. That's a little bit more than where it was a couple of years ago when we talked about this, but it's still pretty darn uh I'll say affordable for what you get, even though it's 55 grand is not, not super cheap. Every one of these SUVs comes with a 3.8 liter V6. It makes 291 horsepower, 262 pound feet of torque. And through an eight speed transmission, it either goes to the front wheels or all four wheels, as in the case of the SX Prestige X Pro trim that I drove. Jack, I wanted to get your feeling on this. Have you driven a new Telluride in either of the more off-roady trims they've come out with? You know, I don't think I have in the off-road trims. Uh, I see a ton of them. Certainly, it is a vehicle that has uh, really taken Kia in an, in a different direction. Uh, and I'm excited to drive them, but I have yet to do that. Yeah, it was, it was interesting because uh, so I dropped my kids off at school every day and I was in the parking lot and there was a, one of the other parents there came over and started talking to me. Uh, she had a couple of years old Telluride. She's getting ready to trade in. She was looking for one like the one that I was driving and she had come over and very excited to find out where I found it and how I got it. So these are still very hot selling vehicles. It's hard. I think from 
a buyer's perspective to find one on a dealer's lot. So uh, that he has got the right idea here. So as I mentioned, it's all wheel drive. And so this is the SX X Pro. It's got uh, all-terrain tires. It has a little bit higher tow rating. I think it's 5,000 pounds as opposed to the regular uh, Telluride. But this is still a comfortable primarily on-road SUV. Like you're not going to take this and go rock climbing at Moab or anything. Uh, this is absolutely still a mall crawler and that's fine because uh, it's what it's meant to do. Uh, towing is 5,500 pounds. Sorry, Jack, not 5,000. So uh, very quiet on the road, very comfortable inside. The top trim has Napa leather. There are three rows of seats here, a captain's chairs in the middle. So this is seven seats instead of eight. Mm -hmm. uh, and Jack, I got to tell you, there's nothing wrong with the interior of this vehicle. Even in the lower trims, I tested one with cloth, cloth upholstery uh, a couple of years ago. It felt nice, even with the uh, Napa leather. I mean, yes, it's nicer, but it doesn't feel substantially like more nice than the, the lower trim. So I think you could get away with a cheaper model. Uh, it's got a large touchscreen. I lost my notes here. So I think it's a 12 point, yeah, 12.3 inch touchscreen. It's got wireless Apple CarPlay and Apple and Android Auto. Uh, no USB-C input up front, which is really irritating to me since Apple ships all of its phones now with USB-C uh, on the other side. So Kia, if you're listening, put a USB-C data port in the front of the, the Telluride, please. Uh, six speakers come standard. Mine had the Harman Kardon soft, I'm sorry, Harman Kardon stereo upgrade, uh, which brings 10 speakers and a subwoofer with an external amp. So plenty of audio uh, capability in this, in this guy. Uh, fully configurable digital gauge cluster. Uh, so I can't say enough about the tech in here. I've always bragged about Kia's technology. I love how they do it. It's simple. It's easy to use. Uh, and the last thing I'll say before we check out is that the Telluride is one of few vehicles that made the cut for 2023's IIHS top safety pick. Uh, they revised their testing to account for the heavier EVs that we were talking about earlier in the show. And the new side test is pretty brutal. So a lot of vehicles got dropped out from 2022 to 23, and the Telluride still made the cut. So if you're looking for a safe vehicle, Plenty of value, great features, good, decent handling. Uh, the Telluride is absolutely the minivan alternative, I think, that I would recommend for most people. It is a nice vehicle, absolutely. One of the things I'm surprised about, Chris, is in pictures, it looks bigger than it seems to be on the road. When I see one on the road, it doesn't seem all that large. And I'm wondering, does it feel large inside? It strikes me, uh, I think it does, but I'm wondering about uh, how you feel about that. It does. You know, you kind of feel like you're stepping into, I'm going to say something so corny, but stepping into a different dimension, right? It feels bigger inside than it looks on the outside. But I think that's a product of the styling, right? It's kind of boxy. It, it holds, it's a very, it has a nice street presence, I guess you could say. So I think, you know, there's, there are a lot of things to say about the styling. I like it. Some people prefer the uh, Palisade, the Hyundai Palisade over that. Uh, but I've always been team Telluride, I think. Yeah, and I think the Telluride in the off-road trims uh, really is a cool-looking vehicle, and I think those are going to score big time in the marketplace, <laughs> even for people who uh, rarely, if ever, go off-road. It's just, uh, you know, looks a piece, looks pretty cool. Absolutely. Well, let's talk about the 2023 Honda Accord, because it's all new. It is the 11th generation of Honda Accord, and it is available in six trim levels. And they've done interesting stuff with powertrain this time around. Two have uh, two of the trim levels have turbocharged four-cylinder engines, and then four have hybrid powertrains. And the hybrid powertrains are the more powerful of the two powertrains, and uh, you know, pretty likable powertrains. Uh, starting price for the base uh, Accord is about twenty-eight thousand dollars, a little bit over twenty-eight thousand dollars, and there's a, about an eleven hundred dollar destination charge on top of that. With that, you get a 1.5 liter four cylinder engine with a CVT, a continuously variable transmission, a one that doesn't have maybe some of the, <laughs> the pain points of many CVTs. Um, if you buy the EX, go up a little bit, you get heated seats and a moonroof, and uh, the price is still right around $30,000. So um, certainly the value is there. The vehicle I was testing has an MSRP of about $32,000 plus that destination charge of another $1,100. It's the Accord Sport, the least expensive of the, of the hybrid trims. And then if you want to go up to the Zudi Touring model, you're going up close to uh, $40,000, $39,000 or so with destination. Um, but it has a lot of cool stuff. Uh, they've added some pretty neat stuff to it. Uh, when you go to the Touring, you get 
head-up display and a 12.3 inch infotainment screen interestingly that's the only level where you get that though uh lower levels not not so much and i like the fact that honda is uh simplifying its lineup i think the competitive camry has something like 17 or you know 20 different trim levels it's it's hard to sort through them all um the LX and EX, as I said, have this 1.5 liter turbo engine that produces 192 horsepower. Um, that's pretty substantial, pretty good. This is a large vehicle, uh, but that's uh, plenty of horsepower to, uh, to get it going. I think uh, back in the day, we would see midsizes with 120, 150 horsepower and think that was pretty good. So uh, getting close to 200 in base trim, uh, very, very good. And then if you go to the two motor hybrid system, as in the test car that I had, it's a two liter Atkinson cycle four cylinder engine in tandem with an electric motor. And the combined system produces 203 horsepower, 247 pound feet of peak torque. Uh, this is a, a vehicle that's just so likable to drive. I mean, it's really drivable with plenty of torque everywhere you'd want it. Uh, it has four selectable drive modes normal and uh, econ and then uh, some a, a sport mode in, in some of them, the hybrids add a sport mode and there's a customizable individual mode. I wonder how many people <laughs> take advantage of that. I mean, uh, what's your take on, on drive modes and all, all that, Chris? I think in the right car, they're absolutely useful. We talked about like some of the AMG and BMW M products. You can feel the vehicle physically as you're driving, it tense up as getting ready to move. Um, for the Honda Accord Hybrid, I don't know. Maybe an eco driving mode would be useful, but uh, sport mode is not. I don't think it's really necessary in those vehicles. Yeah, I agree with you. Well, uh, unsurprisingly, the Accord Hybrids are the fuel economy champs. <laughs> uh, they ha they turn in something like 51 miles per gallon in the Accord EX uh, L Hybrid. Uh, the three other hybrids have a little lower. And I actually somewhat substantially lower, 44 miles per gallon combined figure. Uh, they weigh more, that kind of stuff. Uh, the turbocharged uh, vehicles are not too shabby in terms of fuel economy too. 33 miles per gallon combined, so that's likable. Uh, all of the Accords have the new newest Honda Sensing suite of safety and driver assistance programs. And... Um, They've improved a bunch of things about it. They've improved the camera sensing system to give it a wider field of view. That's good. Uh, that helps it uh, recognize pedestrians, cyclists, road markings, curbs, and road signs, all things you want to avoid running into. Uh, and I think Honda would like you to avoid running into that too. Uh, more natural responses in the uh, adaptive cruise control and lane keeping assist. You know, lane keeping assist can be kind of annoying, don't you think? <laughs> kind of, you want to cross a line a little bit, and they, they, there's good reasons to do it, and it's nudging you back. Uh, how do you feel about that? I often, it's one of the first things I try to figure out how to turn off, actually. <laughs> uh, especially when there's salt or anything on the road, you know, the lines are kind of hard to see sometimes in the system. The vibration and the steering response, I don't, I don't like it. <laughs> yeah, kind of irritating. Uh, Honda has really improved its... Um, audio systems and if Google built in is uh, grabbing headlines. The interesting thing too is Google built in is only available in the, in the uh, touring trim. So you get that, you get Google Assistant, Google Maps and all that. I couldn't test it though, because I had a, a lower line version. I, I kind of like to see that spread across more of the vehicles than uh, Honda has put it in up till now. Uh, but the, uh, the seven inch uh, touchscreen unit that I had, uh, was was quite good, you know, pretty full featured and and easier to use. I wouldn't say Honda systems are the most intuitive of all time, but uh, pretty good. So, uh, and in terms of comfort and utility, I mean, this is a vehicle with giant interior space and huge back seat. So, um, a lot of uh, trunk space too, sixteen point seven cubic feet of trunk space. So, all in all, I think it's one heck of a value. I agree. I think Honda's done a great job with their hybrid technology. They refined the throttle response. They made it feel more like a normal car. And as you mentioned, their technology has improved. Uh, I do believe that Google services will go to other vehicles soon. So hopefully, but uh, totally agree on your opinions of the car. 
Well, and I agree on your opinions of the Telluride uh, based on the fact that I haven't even driven it. So I got to believe you're, you're telling the truth. And uh, when we come back, we will have a terrific guest for you. Scott Tallon is director of product at Jeep. He'll be talking about the 2023 Jeep Compass and other things. So stay with us for that right here on America on the Road. everybody to America on the Road. Jackie Red back with you. We're in the hills above Malibu driving the all-new 2023 Jeep Compass with Scott Talon, Jeep Product uh, Director. You've got it, Jack. Thanks so much for being with us and thanks so much for this day. It's, it's so cool to see the Compass. Tell us all about uh, what's going on with this vehicle. I think it's kind of transformed, but tell us about yeah, it. Yeah, no, it, it really has. It's exciting to, to be here with you guys today and get you know, behind the wheel of the compass, put it through its paces, both on road and of course it's a Jeep, so we're going to take it off road too. But you know, really, the, the the compass has been a you know a strong player in the Jeep lineup for a number of years now. But when we first introduced this generation, um, it quickly became a favorite among a lot of consumers. It's just a you know the styling I think is a lot of what drew people to the compass. Um, it was unique in the marketplace, distinctly Jeep, and it just had a really good proportions and a modern Jeep style to it that attracted a lot of customers. So we continue to enhance the styling and keep the vehicle fresh over the years. But you know, some of the other feedback we got is that, hey, listen, the interior maybe is a little boring, a little bit bland. Um, and then you know, additionally more feedback about the power and the performance and the efficiency of it. So we knew we had additional opportunity and, and certainly listening to our customers and understanding why and what they buy the Compass and how they use it, most importantly, um, really drove how we approached, you know, applying those resources to transform it into what you drove and experienced today. And this transformation really began last year with the 22 model year where we essentially transformed the car inside and out. I mean, the interior is entirely new front to back. And what we did is not just make it, you know, aesthetically, it's much more pleasing to the eye. We've got a lot of premium materials, contrasting colors. I mean, I was in a limited trim there yeah. for a while, and boy, that is an upscale, good-looking trim. It, it really is. And it, so you've got a nice new premium interior, but it's also chock full with really the latest technology. The driver has a, the largest in his class. It's a 10.25 digital cluster, fully customizable. And then the vehicle. Nice, bright colors. I mean, it's, it's real great colors, graphic. Easy to see, real crisp and clean. Again, just easy for the driver, right? We want to make their life easier behind the wheel. Um, and for the driver, not not just the driver, but everyone else in the car, we now have the next generation Uconnect 5. It's a 10.1 inch screen. And with that comes additional technology. So, you know, leave the court at home. Now you have wireless car play and Android Auto. I mean, that's just such a great feature. We always tend to forget cords, and the cord's not working. And guess what? You also have an available wireless charging pad. So, you know, something that's in a midstream, you know, compact SUV, we've got some really nice premium features. Um, you know, in addition to that, it's about safety and security. This is very much a family vehicle as well. And so the Compass has more standard safety and security features than any other vehicle in this class. And some of those features, and again, some are very advanced. Maybe you wouldn't expect it this type of price point, but so uh, drowsy driver protection, for example, that's standard across the entire range. And again, it's one of the really important safety features. I've, I've used it before, and it's, it's activated, and it wakes you up, and alerts you, right. and it says, so it's and it gives you a cup of coffee, doesn't it? Well, it's, it's not suggests quite, that it you suggests have you have a right. cup of coffee, but again, it's looking after the driver. Right, so that's standard, we have that. We have rear seat protection. So, you know, something, again, that's on the minds of parents and families, again, to make a safer and more drivable, uh, enjoyable driving experience. Now, fast forward to where we are today, the 23 model here, to enhance that even further, we essentially replaced the entire drivetrain and powertrain inside the compass. And really, that is the final piece of this transformation. So now the 23 is equipped with a two liter turbo engine, and it's made into an eight speed transmission. And so what this has done is really just transformed the car. Absolutely transformative. I mean, it, it feels so much stronger. I talk about the torque curve. I mean, where this torque is available, I think, is the key. It, it, and, you know, where the power and torque is. It really is. So the overall horsepower is rated 200 horsepower, 221 pound-feet of torque. And, and that's about 50 pound-feet over the outgoing 2.4 naturally aspirated four-cylinder that we had. And you go 50, that's a, that's a big jump in power. And torque, for Jeep at least, because we like low RPMs, that's where it really matters. And what's really great about this engine, at low RPMs, so at 2,000 RPMs, this new two liters making 130 pound feet of torque more than the outgoing 2.4. So the, the such a thing, difference. I mean, it's such a difference. Dramatic. I mean, you don't have to wind the car up to really get it to run and have fun and driving it. And and so while well, that 
obviously it makes for a much more fun driving experience. The acceleration is improved by over a second and a half versus the outgoing car. But again, this is a Jeep, so we've got to focus on how do we improve the capability? How do we enhance and make it better for the driver off-road too? So as you can imagine, having more torque at a lower RPM just makes the ability for the compass to traverse obstacles with less effort. So we have the same best-in-class crawl ratio in our Trailhawk, which is 20 to 1, but now with that additional torque available at 2,000 RPMs, it's a lot better off-road too. So, yeah. you know, I think that it's really been a combination of a series of changes that really took, really, over the course of 18 months um, in maintaining, you know, a fresh styling exercise that is, you know, always under evolution. Um, it's, it's really put the compass in a position where I think it's the new standard for compact SUVs. Right. Well, you're great at interviewing yourself, and I appreciate that, Scott. But one thing you missed, I think, is fuel economy from the new powertrain. It's much better, isn't it? And so you got more power, more torque, and better fuel economy. And better fuel economy. And so you're going to pick up city plus two, highway plus two. So overall, plus two MPG fuel economy. So not only do you get the power and performance, the fun to drive, all that better off-road experience. Oh, and it's more efficient. And not only is it more efficient for the consumer, something that's you know very important to us is it's better in CO2. So we have improved CO2 emissions out of this new two liter versus the two four. So big benefit for us because um, again that's important to us and one of our key priorities and objectives. Yeah. Talk about uh, how this vehicle is used, right? I mean this is one of the entry levels into the Jeep brand, right? A lot of people this is their first experience with Jeep, right? Um, a, a, a less expensive way to get into a Jeep than a lot of ones, you know, that might imply that they're not, you know, guide the wool off-roaders, right? Uh, you know, tell us about how this is used and then how that affects you, what you do as a product planner. Yeah, you know, so I went back and I started this and said, you know, what drew people to come to begin with? They know it's the style. They, it was one, distinctly Jeep, but it was, you know, distinct and unique in the marketplace, too. And, and for us, I mean, that's been a key hallmark is, is that piece of it. Um, but just to, to keep it fresh has been really the key in the success of, of what Compass is. And how people use it, it really depends on the customer. Some of them actually do take their vehicles off-road. Um, or if they want to go to the ski slopes, they know that they want a true, capable, four-wheel drive system. And as you experience today, that active drive system in the Compass is very sophisticated traction management system. Not just for off-road, but all weather conditions. So, you know, while styling is high on the purchase reason, so is 4x4 availability. And, you know, again, something I missed, but that's one of the new changes for 23 is that four-wheel drive is now standard across the entire range. So all the way from the sport to the most aggressive off-road capability trail hunt, you now have standard four-wheel drive. Not just that off-road, but all the weather capability. It gives you really good peace of mind. So, I, you know, that being the, the second, you know, really a top consideration is, you know, for Jeeps and 4x4, four four, we moved to a standard 4x4 four four, four four system. Yeah, and I think that's uh, great that you did that. It makes uh, all the sense in the world. I mean, others are competitors are switching to all-wheel drive, so right. it certainly makes sense that Jeep would go away from the front-wheel drive. Absolutely. Uh, compact SUV is, I think, the biggest segment out there, right? I mean... So it's divided into a bunch of different sub-segments, but you know, let our listeners know how the, how the uh, compass fits in. Yeah, it does, and, and you know, the, the, the lines are blurred, and, and we do our segmentation probably a little bit differently than, than what I think the general public would, would classify vehicles, but you know, there's a broad range. You can think of any given brand that's in market today, and they have something that competes with the compass, right? All major brands and OEMs have something along that same size. Um, and price point as a Jeep Compass, and, and there's a lot of really strong competitors out there, and frankly, between the feedback from our customers, watching the competition, and, and what's being, you know, where that demand's going in the marketplace, all of those components really drive, you know, how we, you know, allocate our resources and where we put them in the future, and I think that we really got this Compass, you know, hit the mark, and really striving for best in class, or class of exclusives, and so when they're looking at it, they go, I didn't expect that from a Compass. You know, you open the door, you look at it, and just visually, you're like, wow, this is nicer than I expected. Walk us through the trim levels, would you? Because yeah. you've got some interesting stuff, and obviously you've got some trim levels that others don't have. You're right, you're right. So our entry level is, is a sport compass. And again, like all the others, it's standard with the 2-liter turbo, standard with the 10-point inch. You know, you can all that safety and security that I talked about is standard in our base trim. 
That's the starting price of $29,995, so very affordable, but it's not going to have all the bells and whistles. It's not going to have the big fancy wheels on it, um, like some of the higher trims. Moving up, um, you have a Latitude bike class, and that's really your velocity model. That's where the mainstream really comes in. Uh, good option, good context selection, uh, aesthetically. Bright work on the outside, a nicer wheel option, um, just improving the aesthetics both inside and out. Uh, then we have a Latitude Lux that brings a leather interior to the inside of the Latitude. So you just can taking the premium of the inside of the vehicle up another notch, again with some more technology features. Um, the Limited is really our top spectrum. Um, that's where you get the largest wheels, um, you know, full leather interior, a lot more of the safety. Uh, What's the features. MSRP kind of roughly uh, for a little bit? Uh, the limited MSRPs, uh, Amy, if you've got those uh, handy, I prefer to Amy, because I'll, sure. I'll give you a number, it'll be the wrong number. Yeah. <laughs> um, Just kind of ballpark. The, the limited, I think, is in the 30, she's going to grab it. I'm sure really. she's going to grab it. I mean, you're clever editing here. Right? Yeah, yeah, I'll up. make this happen, yeah. Okay. No, I, I, I think you sent this to me just last night. I relied on Dave to, to handle the, the, the price. Uh, base MSRP uh, is about 354 For limited? 354 for the limited. Yeah, that's an impressive and, and price point. I thought it might be closer to that. No, and that's a really a fully loaded car. And then yeah. on top of it, you know, we're cheap and we like to do a lot of what we call special editions. So uh, based on the latitude trim, we have an altitude package, which brings in all the black exterior accents, you know, gloss black wheels, gloss black trim on the outside, the inside, really a unique look. Right. Um, and then built off the, the limited, we have a high altitude model, which is, again, same formula, but a more premium version. Uh, and then the third version we have special edition right now in the market is the red edition. So again, a very unique look, fully body colored, dip looked. Um, it's just it's distinctive, it's unique, and again, we keep them fresh, we keep them in and out of market, but really spanning a full range of, of you know, say 30,000 and kind of a base right. level point, really running up to about 40,000. And then so, Trailhawk is in there somewhere too. Right? And then Trailhawk is, uh, is really the, you know, kind of a price point for the Trailhawk, Amy. But it's your dedicated off-road. Yeah, it is. So 35.7. Yeah. So the dedicated off-road variant is, of course, our Trailhawk model. The price point there, 35.7, but it brings in just a whole host of just the really cool off-road bits. So now, you know, like all Jeeps. Yeah. What are some of the things that it has? Yeah. So you know, it, you know, what's cool about our four-wheel drive system, you have the ability to have a select train management system in it, and what Trailhawk does, it, it brings in a rock. So because you have the additional ground clearance, you have a full complement of body armor underneath the car, so skid plates protecting all of the critical components, um, and then you have an active drive low system and a four wheel lock. So what that does is it gets us down to our best possible crawl ratio, which is a 20 to one, that is best in class for the segment, locks it into place, and it puts power to all four wheels. So what the compass has, and part of the secret for that fuel pump is we have a disconnected PTU, power transfer unit at the rear, where we can disconnect that at high speeds and cruising, where we only put power to two of the wheels, and it's more efficient. Trailhawk, four low, four lock, it's, it's business. And you're, you're you know, off-road, you need that four-wheel traction manual. You also get uh, hill descent control in uh, the Trailhawk too. Again, you can be in very slippery, loose conditions like you were uh, today. It's very fit today. And, it it works know, like a chair. It's, it's, it's wonderful. It's, what it can do is modulate each individual wheel for ABS, where it's slipping and where it's not slipping, to apply the brakes individually at all four corners to maintain it on some really tough, treacherous yeah. condition. Something you can't do with the brake pedal. Right. right. It, just, it couldn't possibly do that. What else should people know about Compass uh, before we sign off on this? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I think the Compass for us has been a, a, a key player to the lineup. To your point, it's really one of the entry levels to the brand. We have the Compass on one hand, we have the Renegade, appealing to two really different customers. Uh, the Renegade probably a more traditional, the Compass a more modern, more sophisticated customer. And, you know, what I'm happy about is that now the exterior, now in the interior match and the powertrain. So I think for me, we've always had just a great looking vehicle that stood out in the crowd. A, a, a lot of, you know, really good competitors, but we put the resources in it to really kind of leapfrog the competition, both in terms of 
comfort, technology, safety, connectivity, but at the same time, we have this great powertrain that we knew we wanted to get the compass and it really complete that that package yeah. that it is today. Yeah, transform it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, terrific, Scott Town. Thank yeah. you. Uh, thanks so much for being with us. We no do Jack appreciate it. Always great to talk to you. Always, yes. Appreciate it. And uh, stay with us, everybody. We'll be right back right here on America on the Road. Welcome back to America on the Road with Chris Teague, Jack and Red back with you for listener question time. We love to take your listener questions and answer them on the show. If you have a listener question, submit it to editor at drivingtoday.com, editor at drivingtoday.com, and we'll answer it on an upcoming show. We'd love to hear from you if you just have a comment or something. And in fact, apropos that, Chris, we have uh, a Jesse in Thousand Oaks, California says this. You've been talking about unintended consequences lately, and I ran across a column that talked about that, too. I thought you'd be interested in it. And then he sent it along. And this is a, a Reuters column by a, a writer named Gavin McGuire. And he's talking about unintended, unintended consequences of electric vehicles. Uh, yet they're not the unintended consequences we've been talking about, uh, most recently talking about lowering speed limits. Um, but here's one that, uh, you know, struck me. I, I never would have thought about this at all. Um, the emission cutting policy, I, I'm quoting almost directly from his column here. The, the effect of emission cutting policy has been a surge in, in Northern hemisphere water temperatures since strict new pollution regulations came into effect three years ago. And apparently what's happening is when they reduce air pollution, uh, some things are going in the water <laughs> Uh, that is changing the, the water temperature. And that alone can, uh, changing the ocean temperature certainly can change climate. I mean, who would have thought of that, right? <laughs> is there, so I'm a little, I'm puzzled by this. They're, they're drawing a connection between reductions in air and emissions, basically, and air quality uh, with an Apparently there in are water temperature? particles that go into the atmosphere that have been going into the atmosphere. And when uh, we've changed that and lowered the amount of sulfur particles that are going into the atmosphere, then there is more solar radiation in the oceans and absorbed by the oceans. So the ocean temperature rises. Mm -hmm. ah, so okay. this is, uh, yeah, and <laughs> the head explodes, right? Uh, you know, thinking about this, I mean, uh, certainly we don't want, I, I guess we don't, or maybe we, or it doesn't matter. I, you know, that's another thing where how many of these things are operative and really mean something and how many of these things are just, uh, you shrug your shoulders and you go, okay, ocean water temperatures have changed through the decades. Um, they're going to change. I, I can guarantee you they will continue to change. So, uh, is this a threat or is this okay? Yeah, who knows? Uh, I live a couple of miles from the, the coast of the Gulf of Maine, and it's one of the quickest warming bodies of water anywhere in the world. So, uh, And they're saying that lobster is moving further offshore, making it harder to fish and making it more expensive. So, I mean, these things have impacts. It's just this is, uh, again, this is, I mean, I can see you you explain the logic. It makes sense to me now. But uh, that is that is one unintended consequence that I had no no concept of even pondering. Right. Well, here's another one. And uh, again, something I would not have thought about. Um, some of the things we talked about, uh, renewable energy has f prompted us to build different things and then they wear out and then you have to recycle them or do something with them. You ha have to either recycle them or they go into dumps somewhere, uh, which isn't the best thing. This is, <laughs> we've talked about batteries and batteries are, are being recycled. There's some issues with that that I, maybe I can get into, but wind turbine blades, think of that. I didn't think they wore out, number one, but apparently they have a useful life of about 20 years, and then you have to figure out what to do with them. Also, their design keeps getting better and better, so they're being replaced, but these are giant things, and like, what do you do with them? I mean, <laughs> these things, uh, you know, can weigh two tons. They're gigantic. Um, Again, what do you do about that? Yeah, I don't know. I've 
been I'll be the first to admit that I've been frustrated stuck behind one as they try to move it down the highway <laughs> as slowly as possible but uh, I don't think that they have to have a way to recycle the materials in these things obviously if it's you know several tons that is a little different than throwing a can in the in the recycling bucket as you walk through the kitchen but uh, I mean this some of these things Jack and I got to tell you some of these things sound like just reasons to be reasons to naysay right you know reasons not to have wind turbines reasons not to have evs uh i think that the the benefits far out at risk outweigh the risks of having a few worn out uh wind turbine blades but that's just my opinion yeah i mean i i kind of agree with you and yet i would not say reuters is a far right-wing organization and the no, column that's no. going to be be pushing a a uh anti-ev um agenda here or anti-climate change fixing agenda. So I was uh, kind of uh, interested to see what was being said here. Um, and again, uh, this might not be the reason to uh, to change policy, but it is something to point out that there are unintended consequences of a lot of things. And uh, well, they're unintended because we don't anticipate them, right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, here is a, maybe this is a, a little more in our lane, Chris. Uh, this is a question from Willie in Birmingham, Alabama. He says, I'm looking at midsize SUVs and I want to tow my bass boat with it. Great idea. Do you have recommendations for that? Well, it turns out there are several great options, uh, and some of which aren't even all that expensive, at least by standards of modern midsize SUVs. Uh, the Jeep Wagoneer and the Grand Wagoneer, which are on the more expensive side as you go up the trim the trim levels, but they can tow 10,000 pounds in certain configurations. So that's pretty darn good. That's a that's a larger trailer or boat. Um, let's see, the Lincoln Navigator, 8,700 pounds. Uh, I mentioned the Durango before we got on the air. That one actually turns out to be further down the list. But some of these, a the Toyota Sequoia can tow 9,500 pounds. Yeah, I mean, that's a little yeah. bigger than midsize. Yeah. But- yeah. yeah, you go, you know, you get up into three rows there. So there are plenty of great options. I think for me, it would probably still be something like, uh, you know, the Kia Telluride that we talked about earlier. 5,500 pounds is enough to pull a bass boat, uh, depending on your your boat, I guess. But that for me would be the trade off between comfort and capability and price, frankly, and then the, the, the towing capability. Yeah, I mean, I would look at the towing capacity of a Ford Explorer 2. That's uh, basically a rear drive platform. You can get a rear drive Explorer, which I think is better for towing than a front drive vehicle. Uh, probably the Telluride with the great to- towing capacity is four wheel drive or all wheel drive. But uh, that is a, a good choice, I think, uh, depending on the configuration. But look that up and you're probably going to find enough towing capacity. I'm not sure what a bass boat weighs. Uh, I've never had a bass boat. I've had plenty of boats, but never a bass boat. So, uh, But my my guess is that that would be a fairly good choice. And I also endor- endorse the choice of the Dodge Durango. I think that's a great tow vehicle. Well, we used to pull uh, my uncle's bass boat behind a Ford Ranger, one of the earlier Ford Rangers. So it uh, looks like the dry weight on boat and trailer is 2,500 pounds, Jack. So I think any of these have plenty plenty of pulling capacity. Yeah. Very, very cool. Of course, you you put a bunch of stuff in the boat when it's on the trailer. <laughs> you just you yeah. end up towing a lot of a lot more stuff than uh, a lot more weight than you think. Well, let's take one more question. Grant in Henderson, Nevada uh, says, uh, my new Mazda CX-5 has a lot of electronic safety systems on it, but some of them, and he po- uh, points at lane keeping, are pretty irritating. Are there ways to turn them off? There actually are ways to turn them off, not in every vehicle. But, Jack, I think you actually looked it up for the CX-5 and and figured it out, didn't you? I did. There are ways, uh, fairly simple ways to turn it off. I would say consult that thing that people pretty much never consult, and that is the owner's manual, and it will tell you how to turn some of this stuff off. It's it's fairly easy once you know how, right? I mean, it's a matter of just selecting enable or uh, disable uh, in a menu, but you have to get to that menu. So I would say check the manual, and I would say across the board. And we're not uh, pointing the finger at Mazda CX-5. I think a lot of these systems could be irritating to some folks, and uh, the ability to turn them off probably isn't a bad idea. I mean, uh, what's your overall take on some of these electronic systems? Um, which ones would you leave on? Which ones would you turn off? What? How do you feel about that stuff? Yeah, my favorite one of all time is blind spot monitoring and rear cross traffic uh, monitoring. Those things kind of come together 
you know, I back out of my driveway every day and it's one of those things that, that I think about. Uh, rear view cameras, I think are super helpful. Any sort of uh, collision avoidance, so forward to collision avoidance, uh, rear cross, like as I mentioned earlier, cross traffic assist, lane keep assist, I turn it off. If it's a button that I can see right away, I turn it off. Uh, you know, uh, no beeping and vibrating and steering wheel uh, intervention is going to make me feel safer. And in fact, makes me feel less confident about driving, especially if I'm in a situation around a lot of other vehicles. So that's my call. And I think it's lucky that you can turn it off in your CX-5 because some don't let you. Yeah. I mean, I'm spot on with you. I think it's lane keeping that bothers me the most. And, um, what I have a tendency to do is be just too lazy to turn it off and just start ignoring it. And then you're ignoring these warnings. And I don't think that's a good thing either. I I, I think that you might be warned of something else and, and you're thinking, oh, Ignore I just it. went over, you know, a solid white line a little bit as I'm, you know, pulling through the parking lot or doing this or that on, on the highway where, I, you know, I'm kind of straightening the road a little bit by going over one of those white lines. And uh, quasi illegal, I guess, but uh, I think justified. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think uh, that ends the questioning, but uh, you have some stuff to talk about, I'm certain, Chris. Yeah, I'll jam it in real quick here. So, your test driver is giving away a day pass to the Skip Barber Racing School, any of their locations across the country, or the Team O'Neill Racing School here in New England. I realize, you know, people don't want to come to New England just to drive rally cars in the mud, but I, I think I would. Yeah, uh, in I any would. case, all you have to all you have to do is head to Instagram at your test driver. Follow us there. Tag a friend. Follow us on Facebook, and that's it. These passes are valued at more than $1,000 a piece, so these are a good deal, and you can get in for free. So uh, check us out, yourtestdriver.com. Great stuff, great stuff. Please check out my newest book, Dance in the Dark. It's a crime thriller inspired by true crime, and uh, it's available on Amazon in Kindle and paperback form, so look for that. Um, if you love the show, or even if you like the show, pass it on. Let people know what radio station on which you listen to it. Uh, and uh, pass along the podcast if you like. Uh, if you like the podcast, uh, hit that like button, subscribe. We'd love to have you as a uh, permanent member of the America on the Road family. And thanks to uh, so much for the Sports Map Radio Network stations for carrying on the uh, carrying America on the Road. And finally, thanks to you for listening. We do appreciate it. Join us again next time for another edition of America on the Road.